I'm Lisa Rundell. I'm the Operations and Finance Director um, here at the Chamber. And Lisa is out today. And um, Dan is out of, on vacation as well. So um, I'm going to muddle through today. This is my first time. So um, we'll just go around, introduce ourselves, and then I'll and, and introduce our speaker. Um, so why don't we start with David? Good morning, everybody. Dave Peters, Columbia Cascade Housing, Mid Columbia Housing Authority. Um, still working through our down payment funding. Send any vets, you know, veterans. Um, we have a specific set aside for them. And especially in Hood River, we could go actually up to $120,000 in down payment funds. So please send them our way. Thanks. Scott? Uh, good morning, everyone. Scott McKay. I'm the community liaison for Circles of Care. And we're excited that we're having our chamber ribbon cutting this coming Tuesday at 2.15. We have an informational meeting for any potential volunteers and current volunteers at one to two o'clock at the Mid Columbia Senior Center. And then after that, 2.15, we're having the ribbon cutting. So anyone who's interested can attend. Thank you. Thanks, Scott. Casey? Good morning. Uh, Casey with Casey Business Solutions. I'm just going to kind of listen in. Kids are a little chaotic this morning. Um, but some really exciting news um, as far as the Fort Dallas Fourth, we reached a record number of people this year. Uh, over 27,000 individual accounts were reached. Um, and so kind of like a community goal there that we, we hit. So very excited to share that. Bill? Good morning, Phil Brady, Wasco County Commissioner. Don't have any of my own news much to say, but if, if uh, Dave Peters at Housing can add some more information about the Rand Road project being approved, if you have something uh, on your desk you can share. Yeah, not a lot. I, I'm not directing about that. It's going to be, I, I mean, the last time I saw it, I think it was 134 apartments. Um, wow. we, we're going to try to have some ownership in there, but that was is just too hard of, of a number to get to to make them affordable. But yeah, I believe it's going to be over 130 um, apartments off of Rand Road, um, not too far off of um, whatever it is, whatever the road that goes by Safeway and, and uh, Walmart, are okay. just barely off that. Um, yeah, it's exciting news. But that's a really about all I know at this point. Sorry. Where, where is this development? So Rand Road is off of which road is it you guys tell me out um cascade cascade sort of between uh, walmart and safeway oh in hood um, river yeah Got up it. the road from there um about uh i guess it'd be about the equivalent of a block kind of about where the bluff starts there's a little bit of a rise and then it's a bigger rise it's right um starting at that bigger rise is where the apartments are going to be got it thank you okay phil you can go next <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, Philip Masher, uh, Sotheby's Real Estate, uh, uh, Dells Art Center, and Planning Commission. A uh, couple, couple messages from the Dells Art Center. Um, wanted to point out again, uh, this Friday, uh, tickets go on sale for our Diamonds and Denim Dance Party and uh, Art Center Benefit. Uh, out at the Pines. It's going to be a really fun. Uh, a line dance instructor will be there. Um, so again, this Friday, July 7th, uh, tickets go on sale for that. Uh, to, today, this evening, uh, we are uh, opening th uh, the current exhibit called Geometry and Whimsy. Uh, two local artists, Myrna Anderson and Charlene Rivers, are showing uh, Oregon landscape paintings in really interesting and uh, different techniques. And then uh, I also just uh, once more wanted to point out the um, really cool uh, uh, Music in the Parks series that the library and uh, Parks and Rec put on in City Park on Wednesdays at six. Uh, last night was a puppeteering show. Uh, last week, Victor Johnson uh, played a concert. So um, check out the library's website for the uh, program and hope to see 
uh, any and all of you at City Park uh, one of these weeks. And that's it for me. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Tanya? Good morning, Tanya Brumley with Northwest Natural. I just want to let you all know that United Way, the Columbia Gorge has one of our fundraising concerts, which is coming up July 21st at the Bargeway Pub. Uh, the money that we give away in the gorge or uh, that we earn in the gorge stays in the gorge. And so this is one of the fundraisers to help with all of our local nonprofits. So it'll be at Bargeway on the 21st. Tickets are on sale online or you could buy them at the Bargeway or you can also buy them at the Chamber. So we're really grateful for that. We have two bands this year, so we're super excited. There is a uh, an auction in between the bands of about 12 items and you can also win uh, or take a chance to win a uh, e-bike. So we're excited about that as well. It's a pretty high quality one. So $50 raffle ticket will give you the chance. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Or go to the United Way, the Columbia Gorge website. Thanks, Tanya. Rob? Good morning, Rob Garrett, Mid Columbia Senior Center. It's kind of the dog days of summer right now. We're just working on staying cool. We have no big events going right away. Uh, just the typical stuff we have going on. Of course, Scott's ribbon cutting next week will be here. It's a good thing he told me about it, so I get the right date. Thanks, Scott. <laughs> anyway, just business as usual down here. We're busy with music every day at 11 a.m. and just all kinds of fun stuff going out throughout the day in all air-conditioned rooms. So come on down and join us. Thanks. Travis? Uh, good morning, Travis Stray, Dennis Health, Columbia Gorge. It's been a while since I've been on. We've had a few things happening here, uh, formerly known as Mid Columbia Medical Center. So we had an incredible celebration on June 14th where we launched our new name, our new logo. Um, we are now officially part of the Adventist Health System. Uh, the differences are already being made. Um, we can already, there's integration projects that are already starting to happen um, that are going to make our healthcare system that much better. So if you are a patient, everything is pretty much still standard, seeing your same providers, seeing the same friendly faces that welcome you to the clinic. Um, but we are starting to make some differences here internally uh, with some new equipment purchases that will make some differences as well as um, I think some things that the employees are going to get notified on uh, by the end of the week that are going to really, um, I think, bring some smiles to their faces as well. So we're super excited to be part of the Adventist Health family. Our new name is Adventist Health Columbia Gorge. And we're looking forward to a bright future in healthcare. Thank you. I, I got a question for Travis. How long is it going to take you to stop saying MCMC and start saying AHCG? It's taking me, it's going to take me a while. <laughs> well, Scott, I, you did not hear me say Mid Columbia Medical Center at all. So it's already, the change has already happened for me, but I've, I'm only, uh, I, I'm only been here for about two and a half years. So I, it's probably pretty easy. One thing we were pretty much told by Adventist Health is we do not use our four letters as an acronym. So we are Adventist Health Columbia Gorge or we are Columbia Gorge. So um, we will start a kind of a public branding campaign here in the next couple of weeks to let everyone know. But I think, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong with, um, you know, we have a 122 year history in this community. So looking at us as MCMC is, is not a bad thing either, but we're very excited for the future. Thank Everyone you. can say it with me. Adventist Health, Columbia Gorge. <laughs> okay, thanks, Travis. And Sue? Hi, good morning. Um, Columbia Gorge Community College Foundation. I'm Sue Davis. I have, I'll keep introducing myself for a while since I'm still kind of new. And I apologize. I have a little cold, so I'll make this kind of brief. Things are quiet on campus right now. Um, we're in our summer session, so I think we only have about 150 students on campus. We are working uh, pretty diligently on the Columbia Gorge Community College Foundation golf tournament. So um, I have lots of information on that if anyone's interested in playing golf or sponsoring um, for that day, which is September 9th. It'll be our 23rd annual golf tournament and the second year that it has been run post COVID. So we're excited about that. Another just small bit of news that I'll share is that our electric vehicle chargers are now up and running at our Hood River campus. So for students or faculty or staff that um, need to charge their vehicles while they're on campus, those are now hooked up and ready to go. And um, I think that's it for the updates for me today. 
Okay, great. Sue, make sure you get all that information to the chamber because we can put it in our e-blast and um, out on our kiosk. So. Okay, thank you. Um, I will do any that. If you have an event, just let us know and we can help share that. Sounds great. Thanks. All right. Thank you. Matt, Cole? Are you there, Matt? You picked on me while I was standing on the other side of my desk. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Matt Cole, Direct Line AT, not much going on with us. Uh, focusing a lot on AI integrations lately. So if you're ever interested on automating tasks within your business, let me know. Okay, thank you. I think that's everybody. Um, if I've missed anybody that's popped in, um, just speak up. If not, we'll go right into our speaker, Robert Wallace, who is with Y East Resource Con Conservation and Development. Um, Robert has worked with the agriculture sector and rural small business throughout the region. He has um, agreements to work with the Rural Electric Co-op and the PUD and supports their energy conservation program. So with that, Robert, I'll just let you take over. All right. Hey, good morning, everybody. <clears throat> So I'm calling in from the south side of Deeper this morning, <laughs> off Deeper Gap Road. <laughs> um, yeah, so hey, I'm uh, Robert Wallace, and I'm the executive director at Y East RCND. And uh, I've been with Y East since about late in 2009. And originally, um, before that, I was I'd worked in manufacturing on the Port of the Dows. I worked for uh, Home Shield when they first came to town. I worked for Insel Foam back where the, um, the city uh, headquarters is now and stuff back in the day. I was the production manager for Insel Foam and then the plant manager for Home Shield. We started in Hood River on the port there and then actually moved to the Dallas and built the new uh, facility there where uh, Powder Pure is now down by Google. And so um, I was, I would also started uh, uh, doing home inspections. So I'd worked with a lot of the realtors and stuff and back in, about 2008, the housing market took a dive and uh, people weren't buying and selling houses. And so things were kind of slow. And I seen an ad uh, for uh, a group called White East looking for someone to do agricultural energy work. And so um, I had went down to Redmond and interviewed with them. It was supposed to be a one year, uh, one year adventure. And here it is now we're at 2023 and I'm still still on <laughs> With it, and so the original program was called Save Water, Save Energy, and it was a it was a contract through Bonneville Power. It was actually a grant to Y East to try to see if we could get more energy savings out of the um, rural electric utilities and PUDs and uh, and the agriculture sector. In the agriculture sector, most of the energy savings in the West are coming from irrigation efficiency, and so that's been a big part of our work. Um, previous to that, uh, Y East actually uh, formed in 1994, and they did a lot of uh, kind of rural development type work. They're, we're a nonprofit 501c. Uh, we had offices in the Dalles and then also down in Redmond. And originally, Y East covered a six-county area, um, all local, you know, a local board of directors. Uh, we covered Hood River, Wasco, Sherman, Crook, Deschutes, and Jefferson counties. And then in 2000, about 2013, um, we actually used to receive money out of the farm bill uh, because we're kind of a, I don't know, I call it a nonprofit cousin of NRCS. We actually used to have an NRCS staff person, which that's part of USDA. And they were a coordinator for us. They did a lot of the grant writing, um, a lot of the project management and those things. Well, the funding in the farm bill went away and our coordinator went away. A lot of the RCNDs across the, across the United States actually went away. And so Oregon used to have eight different RCND councils throughout the state. Each of them had six to eight different counties and they did kind of rural development conservation type projects and stuff. And so we've actually been able to survive through our work with the, uh, working with the energy part um, in the rural sections of the state. And right now there's really only two RCND councils still in operation in the state of Oregon. We're one of them and then Cascade Pacific and they're based out of uh, Corvallis, Oregon. And so I think for today, what I'd like to do is kind of talk a little bit about Y East and kind of go through some of the some of the work and, and programs we're working on. Uh, some of it's 
not overly exciting and some of it's extremely exciting. And so I don't know if I can share, share my screen here, I try this. So you guys should be able to see kind of our logo up there now. And so I, what I'll do is just kind of get, so I can go through the slides here. Figure out how to move. Okay, so why yeast our um, activities? We work a lot with uh, USDA REAP program, which is Rural Energy for America program through USDA Rural Development. We also work a lot with Energy Trust of Oregon. We actually are the irrigation lead for Energy Trust of Oregon statewide as of January this year, and so that's a new contract for us. And uh, with that, we help with all the different ir irrigation projects for the uh, investor-owned utilities, such as uh, Pacific Power and Portland General Electric. And then we also have contracts with uh, Bonneville Power Administration, and then also direct contracts with some of the rural electric co-ops. And so we work locally, we work with uh, Wasco Electric Co-op, Northern Wasco PD. And with that, we help with all their irrigation projects, um, um, any sort of pump upgrade, variable frequency drive, sprinkler hardware upgrades, those types of things. And then one of the other programs uh, that's pretty big for us we've been working on for three years is called eFarms. And that's uh, we brought in electric tractors, electric pickups. Um, and then we've also got um, some like Polaris electric side by sides and some other equipment on the way. And so I'm going to try to show some photos of, of all this. And, Really, this is this program and why yeast is really based in the Dalles. We've got an office out with the Soil Water Conservation District on the port. And um, uh, most of us are working from home, kind of working remote. COVID I definitely uh, threw a, a kink in, you know, kind of folks working together. And so we've kind of stayed pretty much remote and stuff. And so um, staff wise, uh, me on the left. Uh, so I'm not only the executive director, but I'm also what they call a certified energy manager. And so it's, I'm not an engineer, but I'm able to, I've got a certificate basically to go in and analyze a system and, and calculate the energy efficiency or, or calculate like a solar system, how much energy it would uh, produce and those types of things. Uh, Sarah Sweetster, uh, Sarah's from Dufer here also. Um, she's our admin finance person, uh, Michael Clues. Michael's with the Rare AmeriCorps program at the University of Oregon, and uh, the rare, the current rare contract going right now will actually end at the end of this month, and then Michael's going to join us full time uh, at YE starting in August. And we uh, just went last week went through interviews for our new rare that'll join us in September, and so uh, Michael will join us full time at YE, and we'll bring in a new rare person um, starting in September. On the left here, we've got uh, Brad Moore. Brad's a program engineer uh, out of Bend, Oregon. Um, Brad works, his main focus is working on the Energy Trust of Oregon programs. And so between Brad and I, we're the leads with the Energy Trust uh, and uh, with the irrigation sector, um, agriculture projects. And then on the right here, you guys might recognize Pat Davis. Pat lives out by Womack. He lives up on the on the farmstead up by Rock Creek, actually. And so he, he tells me he came out of retirement to do this. And so he's actually been helping us move several of the small tractors around. He helps us get the new folks set up with, uh, with the equipment and those types of things. And uh, so he works on a kind of an as needed part-time basis. And so right now we've got a total of five staff. Um, two years ago, it was just me. And so we've grown quite a bit over the last couple of years. Um, as I mentioned, Michael Clues will join Y East. We'll bring another rare in this fall and probably hire one more person um, later this fall also. So that'll bring us up to uh, seven uh, staff folks um, coming up here. So kind of my, my goal is to, um, you know, kind of my dream anyways, I guess, is to try to get us an office in Dufer and something downtown there so we can have the tractors uh, and, uh, and that may be like in the threshing bee grounds, uh, where we're actually testing them, demonstrating them, and we could bring people in to train them. Um, we've got, I think we got ranked number seven on the county's economic development list for projects for, uh, you might've heard the Dufer Rural Innovation Hub. And so, um, I'm going to kind of talk about some of the programs but that, that concept came about. Nate Stice called me and says, Robert, with all this crazy stuff you're doing, why don't you have an innovation hub in Dufer? And, <laughs> kind of planted the seed it was a little bit of a it was a little bit of kind of a joke at first but um I think maybe there's something to it we'll kind of see if we can't pull something together 
as we move forward with that. So that's kind of a quick in intro on Y East. And what I'd like to do now is kind of talk a little bit about uh, some of the different programs we're working on. And so I'd mentioned um, the contract with Bonneville Power Administration, you know, locally working with the, our local utilities on their efficiency programs. Um, there's not, a, you know, most of the uh, cherry orchards in the Dallas there, their uh, water supplied from um, the Dallas Irrigation District. And they're actually, the Dallas Irrigation District's actually a federal um, reserve customer, Bonneville Power. And so they pump their water straight off the Columbia there and um, it, uh, pump the water up to reservoirs up on the hill, then it gravity feeds down to the different orchards. So I don't do as much with uh, those particular irrigators, but as you get out into like 15 mile out by Petersburg and then down into Dufer, then down into Ty Valley, Mop, and all those folks are pumping water uh, either from uh, power, power provided from Northern Wasco PUD or Wasco Electric Co-op and stuff. And as you guys know, you know, we've been in a, a real drought for the last several years. And uh, actually, locally, we've fared better than some of our uh, neighbors to the south. But we've worked together with the Conservation District, with the Watershed Councils, and trying to help a lot of our irrigators locally here upgrade their irrigation systems. And so what does that mean? That means um, converting from flood irrigation to a pressurized sprinkler irrigation, um, a lot of the hand lines and wheel lines out in the fields, converting those over to pivots. Uh, we worked a lot with uh, Washington State University and Oregon State University around irrigation technology to make the pivot sprinklers uh, more efficient. And so um, sometimes you'll see on these big on these big pivots, which is the big circle um, irrigation systems you see out in the fields, and you'll see the sprinklers hanging really low. And that's a, a new sprinkler design called Lisa. It's low energy spray application. And we're able to get the uh, um, water efficiency up to uh, the mid 90%. So about 99 or 95% of the water you're pumping is actually getting to the ground and um, benefiting the crop. The old hand lines and wheel lines, which is the aluminum pipes you traditionally see out in the field, they're about 65%, 50 to 65% efficient. And so just by making some of these changes, we're able to save significant water. But at the same time, uh, these new irrigation systems run at less pressure and it, it takes less water to get the job done. And so we're able to help them on the energy efficiency side by reduced horsepower, um, pump upgrades, variable frequency drives, all kinds of things there. And so there's rebates available through the um, local utilities to help these guys upgrade their systems. And then there's also quite a bit of funding out there through some of the federal programs and state programs and local uh, grants and cost shares to help these irrigators upgrade their systems to be more efficient. Most of the programs are on the water side. And so our focus is really on the energy side of things. And so it's what you call the water energy nexus. And so there's a connection there. We can help someone be more efficient on the irrigation system. Um, typically there's substantial energy savings to be had also. Um, as I mentioned, Energy Trust of Oregon, um, we, we took over, uh, they put their contract out to bid statewide and actually we're working under another engineering firm out of Portland called Energy 350. Um, that handles all the industrial and agricultural um, energy efficiency programs for Energy, Tr Energy Trust of Oregon statewide. And so myself and Brad Moore out of Bend are really working to focus on uh, those programs. Um, and so that that really takes us, we, were, we do quite a bit of travel. I think last year I put 40,000 miles in my pickup um, traveling around the state. So we're all over the place. Um, traditionally, as I mentioned earlier, Y East was really covering kind of a six county region. And, um, you know, when the, when the, when our funding out of the farm bill got cut, so did a lot of the strings and restrictions as far as what we could do. And so we really don't have a geographic boundary now as an organization. We're more of a nonprofit that works with rural in rural areas on energy type pro projects and stuff. And so it's kind of, it's almost hard to explain sometimes what I do. I know some of my closest friends are like, what exactly do you do? And so we do kind of so many different things and stuff. And so the, that's kind of a lot of the energy efficiency. That's a lot of our core work. What I've talked about so far is probably 80% of our work that we do. Um, one of the other things I mentioned having a rare uh, person, and so that's Michael Flues this year, and his his main 
focus is working with the USDA Rural Development uh, REAP program, and that's Rural Energy for America. And those are those are typically grants and loan guarantees for rural small businesses and agricultural producers for energy efficiency and renewable energy projects. And so traditionally, the REAP program, if you look through the past 10 years at the types of projects they funded, about 95% of them were some sort of a, a solar project. And so it's kind of discouraging to submit other, you know, maybe a pump upgrade or other types of efficiency projects because um, just because of the ranking and, and they had limited funds. Well, um, I'm sure all of you guys have heard of the Inflation Reduction Act and so um, from the federal government. And so a lot of that funding now is starting to trickle through the different federal agencies and stuff. And so we're all uh, hearing of all these new programs every day that are coming out and trying to figure out what it is and can we benefit from it and those types of things. And so with the REAP program specifically, we were originally told there'd be about three to five times the level of funding uh, for the state of Oregon in this for, in this next year. And so um, in actuality, there was actually 10 times the funding that came through for that particular program. And so we've been extremely busy. We've got um, all kinds of different uh, folks that are reaching out to us. Michael actually helps people work through the process. And so if they want to put solar on their building, if they want to if they want to uh, upgrade a pumping system and put a new pump and variable frequency drive, and let's say it's a hundred thousand dollar project, he can actually work with them and through the um, through the application process to support them for the REAP program. And so, the other thing is, is with REAP traditionally, um, folks are trying to go after the grant. Traditionally, it was a twenty five percent grant, and now uh, twenty five percent of the overall project cost is what you can apply for. And so. You wanted to have a, a sizable project that was kind of worth going through the effort um, of that, and uh, now they've actually bumped that up to a up to a fifty percent grant, so five zero, so quite substantial funding there. And so when we leverage those funds, uh, the up to fifty percent, and then also uh, of the funding that's available through the program, I mean, kind of off the cuff rural development said, we'll probably fund every project that gets submitted because uh, they've got that much funding in there. And so we're seeing we're seeing that um, those kinds of things, not only with rural development, but I think we'll also see it with NRCS. And I don't know if you guys are familiar with NRCS, but it's Natural Resource Conservation Services. They're, they're based out with the conservation district here in the Dalles. Um, each county has an office um, and they are part of USDA. And so they do a lot of the on-farm conservation work. And so everything from no-till uh, for, the, for the wheat guys, as far as converting over for minimal tillage for help with erosion, uh, but they do a lot of water conservation work also. And so a lot of times the, if someone's upgrading to a new pivot, a new irrigation system, they might be working with NRCS to help them with funding to do that. And so we're expecting to see quite a bit of funding coming through NRCS also, also tied to the IRA or the Inflation Reduction Act. So, so anyways, that's kind of a lot of our, our meat and potatoes work. I'm going to talk about some of our other smaller programs, and then I'm going to talk about um, uh, Wasco County EV charging and the eFarms program, which is probably the most exciting for folks. And so um, a lot of the work we do also is involved with technology, uh, remote monitoring, those types of things. And so um, we're actually work together with the soil water con Wasco County Soil Water Conservation District and then the, um, the watershed councils. And there's a program out in Dufer, the 15 mile um, stream called FAST. And basically what it is, is we've got the stream that runs through and it's got endangered Columbia River steelhead in there. And the farmers are also irrigating out of that stream. And so as we get into the hot periods, <clears throat> if the stream gets below a certain flow or above a certain temperature, the water conditions get lethal for the fish. And so there's a program set up so that the, when those conditions are forecasted, the farmers will actually shut their irrigation systems off and get a, a payment in lieu of irrigating. And so what we do is we're actually uh, monitoring several of the different pump stations along the stream. And so if they do what they call a fast alert, when fast is the name of the program, they send a, a message out and these farmers then that have signed up for this program will shut the irrigation pumps off, basically leave that water in the stream. It may be a day, maybe a couple of days um, for them to uh, basically try to keep the stream cool and try to keep the flows up to protect the fish that's, that's in the stream. 
in 2009, uh, before this program came about, there was actually a fish kill in um, the 15 mile stream. And uh, since then, there's been a lot of work. If you drive up Dufer Valley now, you'll see several, several pivots and uh, a lot of technology in the area looking at monitoring the water and monitoring the use of water and stuff, trying to, the farmers trying to work together with the system and to help benefit the fish in that. So through that, we also not only monitor the pumps and those types of things, but we also um, have some soil moisture probes out there. And what I'm showing you here is a new probe that we started using and it's called a, it's the brand is Select or Soil Tech uh, wireless. And I think you guys can see the screen here, this yellow, they call it a beacon. And it's actually about the size of a small, like a, about the size of a small Nerf football is about the size of this unit. And you just go out in the field. Um, I use a set of post hole diggers and I, I bury this in the ground about 12 inches and it measures the soil moisture level of the soil in the field. And then every day the farmer gets a report out um, as far as what their moisture level is, and that helps them scheduling their irrigation. And so we've seen the farmers locally um, use this technology and actually reduce their water consumption. And that what the other thing they can do too is um, it gives them a, a dashboard you can kind of see in small form here on the, this little computer screen, but they can watch the, it uses current weather data and then forecast how much they need to irrigate and what their water usage is. And so a lot of times what we'll see is the farmers, if they know hot periods coming in, they'll actually take and, and um, try to get their fields irrigated well. So that, that way they're using the soil as a water bank. And then when it gets super hot, they can actually shut the irrigation systems off and leave that water in stream, benefit the fish um, and benefit the stream and the aquatic habitat there. And so we, we're kind of using technology. If you ask folks that are in the agriculture industry, they'll tell you that technology is moving so fast right now um, in the agriculture sector. They just, they can't believe some of the stuff that comes out. So this- Excuse me, Robert. This, yeah. Uh, Tanya has her hand raised. Okay. I didn't see it, Tanya. Go ahead. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Tanya. Oh, that, that's okay, Robert. I was just being polite, trying not to interrupt you, but I have a question on the, on the oh. um, irrigation. If if a field is not suitable for a pivot, I'm thinking, you know, because of the slope or the dimensions of the field, is there technology for handline improvement and pump improvement that you could assist one of the farmers with? Yeah, yeah. So you know, a lot of you know, so I, I talk a lot about pivots because that's kind of the future, you know, as far as but you know, the most efficient systems, but not every field is suited for a pivot. And so there are, um, there's some new sprinklers um, that Nelson Irrigation has developed that are much more efficient than the traditional impact sprinklers, you know, the brass impact sprinklers. And so a lot of the, a lot of the core programs through the utilities is just sprinklers, nozzles, gaskets, those kind of the sprinkler hardware things so that you're basically putting the water on where you want and that you're, your irrigation system isn't leaking everywhere. And so for sure, if you have someone that has a, um, like if someone locally had an irrigation system, they wanna upgrade and it's kind of, it's older um, and it needs some maintenance and stuff like that, there's the utility programs they can work with, but also through the conservation district, they have uh, OWEB, which is Oregon Watershed Enhancement Small Grants that could be available to help with an upgrade. And then the conservation district, the Wasco County Soil Water Conservation District has cost share programs and they will actually help um, oftentimes if you apply to that program. So there's a few different sources of funding out there. And that's one of the, one of the biggest things we do when we talk to our local farmers is we try to look and see what different programs they may qualify for and uh, try, try to help them you know, get in contact with those different organizations and stuff. And so for sure, um, this our programs aren't only for pivots and uh, the you know the bigger systems, but also the smaller irrigation systems. Okay, no, that's great to know, um, get some contact information from you. I know there's a lot of hay farmers out there that are kind of struggling and those fields, um, as you know, the expense is the pump and the electricity and the time on those hand lines. So anything to help the bottom line would be beneficial. Yeah. Well, and, and I'll say too, I think, you know, I talked a little bit about rural developments programs around more funding coming in. 
And I mentioned, I think you're going to see the same thing with NRCS, which NRCS funds a lot of irrigation systems. And so um, I just, I know locally the, the county director with NRCS is looking at different funding pools. They kind of have a, um, they, they have a different approach on things. They take local feedback and try to identify a geographic area, a watershed, and then focus funding in that area. And so I think, I think over the next few years, you're going to see NRCS come out with um, several new programs or new funding around irrigation efficiency. And so I know even yesterday, I was talking to a local farmer here to, to the Duper area, and he was looking at putting pivots in. I said, I think I would just wait. I said, you've dealt with those old hand lines for 20 years now. I think if you wait just a little bit, I think you're going to see more funding and programs coming through NRCS, and then we'll leverage the federal funding through NRCS with um, maybe cost share through the conservation district to make sure you get your rebates through the utility, and it'll help you out quite a bit for making those upgrades. But there are things you could do today to try to make the system you have as efficient as possible. Um, you know, so kind of do I wait or do I move now as part of the question a lot of times. Thanks, Robert. Yeah. Hey, Phil, I see you got your hand up there. Thank you. Uh, two things. One is, um, can the REAP funds um, beyond just direct agriculture also reach out to, to help? Uh, I'm thinking of uh, small agricultural communities that uh, want to um, uh, renovate their well system. So, so it's, it's it's not a municipality. It's, it's unincorporated. Um, but it's not direct agriculture, but it is an agricultural community. And then also follow up, um, are you involved in the aquifer restoration project on 15 Mile, the insertion wells? Yeah, yeah. and then so your first question, are you asking on REAP who it can, who it can help, the REAP program? Yeah, how, how broad is the definition of agriculture in that sense? Yeah, yeah so... Um, it's agricultural business. And I think with that, they need to get at least 50% of their income through the, through the farm business or a rural small business. And so the challenges we get sometimes, the people that, that maybe aren't eligible would be some of the nonprofit groups, uh, the community center, um, any sort of you know special district or government, they, they're not eligible for the REAP program. But if it's a small business, and so let's say the hardware store, or let's say they don't get 50% of their income, they have a farm stand and they don't get 50% of their income from the farm stand, will they just be a rural small business? You know yeah. what I mean? So they could then apply for that, so. Okay, thank you. That So, so my other question was uh, regarding the insertion well project on 15 yeah. miles. Are you involved in that? Yeah, yeah, we are. And um, I did all the, all the remote sensing and data monitoring for that project. And so um, basically what that is, is we did a, a demonstration project up Dufer Valley. And so we actually um, put an infiltration gallery in. And so we pulled water out of the 15 mile stream early this spring, kind of late winter, early spring. And then we ran it through, ran the water through a large sand um, filter, you might say. Basically it was a pond um, with like a drainage system built into the bottom of it. So we pumped water into this pond and then there was a, a layer of about 10 to 12 foot of sifted soil and then a drainage system under that. So you pump the water in, it drains through this, this soil, fil soil sand filter and then into a drainage um, collection, kind of look like a, a septic system, you might say. And then that cleans the water and then... Um, uh, if the water hits us, if we can get the water clean enough, we can then pump the water into the ground and store it until the next summer. And so um, I've worked with the uh, conservation district on this project, the Watershed Council, um, and basically looking at a um, underground, it's called an M MUS, Managed Underground Storage. And it's a little bit of, I don't know, it's kind of, it's hard for us to, to kind of, um, believe that the water is going to be there when we need it when you put it down in the ground like that but what the the scientists and the engineers are telling us that there's these caverns um, these aquifers in the ground and we, we can actually fill those with water um, when there's plentiful water you know in the winter time and then in the summertime we could actually take and pump that water back into 15 mile stream and they said once you flush those caverns out that the water will be within 
I think three to five degrees of the temperature when you took it out. So think about taking water out in December and it's 36 degrees, uh, storing it underground and, and then we're pumping it back into the stream basically to benefit the fish in August. You know, we're pumping 40, 45 degree water back into the stream. Um, and so that increases the flow in the stream and then actually reduces the water temperature. And so for that project, we actually, uh, we had monitoring on the pump stations. So we hooked into the pump station. We could actually remote run the pump station. Um, and uh, we measured all the flows going into that system. We had monitors on the pond so we could tell how full the pond was. And this way the conservation district could actually watch this whole system from their office or from their, from their phone um, and monitor it. And then um, we, we actually had flow meters on the discharge side of the system. So we'd watch how much water's coming through the infiltration uh, gallery and then uh, monitor uh, what our losses were and then how much flow was coming out. At this time, we did not have a well um, to put the water back in the ground. We were simply studying the infiltration basin on how well it cleaned the water. And they actually, it didn't, it didn't work quite as what they had, uh, had anticipated. And so the engineers are all going back to the drawing board and looking at how do they redesign the system to, to um, help. It wasn't what I would call a catastrophic failure. So it looks like with some adjustments, they can make it so it will work. But um, the additional thing we monitored there is we had um, these really high end water quality sensors. And so we had one in the stream, the 15 mile stream that was measuring a water temperature, turbidity, um, conductivity, um, trying to think what else we were monitoring there. Um, and then we, so we'd measure the source water at the stream, and then we'd also monitor the water quality as it was coming out of the infiltration gallery. So we could get a, a, a live look basically at the water coming through uh, the system. And I've got here. But the, um, I don't want to take up all your time. I, so I hope you can get to some of the really cool uh, tractors okay. and such. So, um, that's enough information for me on that. Okay. If you want to keep, get to yeah. the rest of your I'll just, Yeah, I'll just say, here's the, here's the dashboard of the water quality monitoring. This is actually live right now up at the site um, that we've got. So you can see we're monitoring the temperature, specific conductivity, the pH, uh, the DO, dissolved oxygen, um, turbidity, and then the uh, pressure. So these are all remote sensors that are out there. And we did this both at the source water and the discharge water. So... So anyways, there's a lot of technology out there in ag. I'll just, I'll just kind of leave it at that. And the water storage project was something that we worked on with the conservation district. The other two uh, kind of popular projects locally that we've worked together with the conservation district is the Mosier, what they call the Mosier Million. They basically took two of the big ag wells in Mosier and drilled the, drilled the wells deeper into the deep, deeper aquifers. And we're actually monitoring the pump stations up at those sites monitoring the level of the water at those sites, the amount of flow, and then we can actually, I can run those pumps from my phone um, to turn them off and, and on and those types of things. And so um, next, let's talk about, let's talk about um, some of the tractors and, and some of those things. And so we work together with a program called eFarms. And originally this program was called electric, electric tractor program. And so how it came about was there was a a company in California, and they were uh, getting ready to release an electric tractor. And uh, Fourth is a nonprofit out of uh, Portland, and they were they seen this. They do a lot of work with the car share programs, like the car share the, the car share vehicle that's in the Dallas. That's uh, I don't know soon to be or already at the chamber. I'm not sure if it got moved yet or not. But it says go forth on the side, and that's this fourth group that we work with. They're kind of an e mobility. Um, uh, nonprofit. So they reached out and they said, hey, we see these electric tractors, but we don't know anything about farming. We don't know, you know, how we could get one of these out on the ground or anything. And so would you guys, would you work with us on this? And we want to get two tractors and we just want to test them out and see what they do. And so I said, well, as long as I can be honest, and like, if they work, they work. And if they don't, they don't. I want to talk about what they can do and can't do. They said, yep, exactly what we want. So um, can you guys see the picture of the tractor right now? Yeah, okay. So this little blue tractor here, this is a select track uh, 25 horsepower tractor and it's four wheel drive. It looks it looks just like a little blue colored Kubota, but it's, it's electric. And so um, 
it's a we've got three of these tractors right now on the ground i've got one of these sitting in redmond i've got one down on uh, Sodney Island with a group called Black Food Sovereignty Coalition. They, they grow a lot of the food for the farmer's market in the Portland area and stuff. And then um, trying to think where's our other one at. Our other one is down at the East Multnomah County Soil Water Conservation District just outside of Gresham on their demo farm down there. And then so these are three tractors we've had. Uh, we've had one of the tractors for two years, and then we got two more tractors a year ago to make the three of these. These are a great little hobby tractor or a chore tractor uh, for small farm operations and stuff. It's just a little 25 horsepower tractor and it does 25 horsepower things, but for mowing, spraying, those types of things in the rural area or on a small farm, these things do great with that. And so this was the first electric tractor that came out and um, we were pretty excited with these. We've had these all over the place. Uh, Oregon State University is working with us on the data analysis. I've got remote SCADA systems on all these tractors. So we're monitoring how much energy they use, how long they run, what types of tasks they use them for and stuff. And so the whole, the goal of this program is we know there's a lot of electric powered equipment and vehicles that are, that are being released and stuff. Um, but how do they work in the rural areas? And that's what, that's what intrigues me with this thing. Like, how do we, can we drive an electric pickup out here and, and doofer and mopping and, and the dowels is there places to charge and all those kinds of things. And so that's really what we're kind of discovering with this program. Um, uh, Senator Merkley helped us out. We've got uh, a million and a half dollar grant through U.S. Department of Energy that'll go in uh, to help with additional equipment and um, We'll be bringing additional tractors and stuff into the area. And these these units basically are set so they can be loaned out to farmers that have a similar piece of equipment and they can test it side by side with their with their um, their tractors and that. And so this is the first tractor. Uh, I'm going to show you next. This is our latest tractor we got. I don't know if you guys can see this. This picture um, was taken last week. Yeah. Phil has his hand up. Oh, sorry. Phil. Nope, you're fine. You're on mute there, Phil. Mute uh, might be leading to, to your next slide. I haven't seen the next slide up, but I, my question is, um, this, the word is that tractors are great, except for when you need high power, high horsepower situations. Um, and so I'm wondering if, if hydrogen fueled um, farm vehicles are on the horizon, I know Tanya's organization is working on uh, hydrogen fuel. Uh, so you know, is anything in that coming down? Yeah. Yeah, so I'll, I'll finish on this Monarch tractor, and then I'll talk a little bit about, about hydrogen and, and that. So this um, the Monarch tractor here, we just received this last Wednesday. And so this is actually, it's got one of the Black Widow Arena groomers on there. And this is actually up Dufer Valley. Uh, where I took this photo, and so uh, this tra- Robert, when I'm I'm still seeing the solar track. Oh, are you? Well, let's fix that. All right. No wonder no one's excited to take a look at that tractor. Okay, can you see a different tractor now? Okay. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, this tractor is uh, manufactured in in Ohio and California, so it's American made. Um, it's called the Monarch. Uh, it's, a, it's a startup company. It's a 40 horsepower tractor. It's really designed to work in the orchards and vineyards. And so fully electric, um, it's driver optional. And so this tractor will actually read it up in the, up in the cab and the roof there. It's got all kinds of uh, technology, cameras and everything. It'll actually, as it goes down through an orchard or a vineyard, it senses where the vegetation's at, and it drives right down the center of the row. Um, and then also it's an open source platform. And so as it's going through, if you're mowing or spraying an orchard or a vineyard, you can actually, um, they're building it so technology can actually scan the fruit, look if, look for disease, disease stage of growth, yield, um, any, you know, all kind of all those visual aids if you're going through the uh, orchards and stuff there. So we're pretty excited about this particular tractor. Now, I mentioned the first tractor was 25 horse. This one's 40 horsepower tractor. The first tractor I showed you was more of a, I call it a chore tractor. Uh, and this is more of a commercial use tractor. So this tractor here, 
uh, depending on what you're what you're doing with it, um, they're saying you can get a runtime up to 10 to 12 hours out in the orchard with it. So if you're if you're spraying, you're probably going to use less horsepower, uh, less energy than if you're mowing or tilling. And so your hours of time of operation will fluctuate um, depending on how hard you're working the tractor. So the harder you work it, the less hours you'll get. Um, and the easier to work it, the more hours you get. And so we're pretty excited about this. This particular tractor we'll have for about a month. Um, we've actually got the manufacturers uh, coming in on Friday, and they're going to go through the, all the operations of the tractor with us. We haven't, we don't even know how to turn the autonomous features on yet. Uh, our main focus is studying the electrical power plant and kind of the electric side of the tractor. Um, but we're the first one. I think this is the first tractor they've sold outside of California. So it's definitely the first one in the state of Oregon. Uh, I know several of the local orchardists have orders and deposits on these tractors. A lot of the a lot of the orchards um, they're they're using a smaller tree now than what they traditionally have used, and so the row spacing is coming in uh, tighter. And so the orchards um, are going to lend themselves to these smaller tractors. And I know talking with um, several of the local orchardists, they're super excited about this Monarch tractor. The biggest investor in Monarch is Case New Holland. And so most of you guys know New Holland tractors or Case tractors. And so Kate, or New Holland actually took the uh, this electric power plant system and put it in one of their uh, larger frame tractors. They've got a 70 horsepower electric tractor that they're going to produce. So New Holland will produce about 40 of these tractors this fall. And uh, they've actually they asked us if we wanted to have one of those tractors to demo as far as our project. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, kind of a lot of different manufacturers that are that are getting ready to release um, equipment. JCB, which makes uh, backhoes and mini excavators and front end loaders and those types of things. They've got a lineup of electric power plants or electric powered units. And then Volvo is another one. Volvo has a front end loader, some mini excavators and stuff. And so. Where I'm going to with this is a lot of the stuff we're talking about is small horsepower tractors. And so 40 horse, 25 horse, and maybe up to 70 horse. And I don't, I don't know that you'll go larger than that with a battery operated tractor. And Tanya, I see you got your hand up there. Yeah, I'm just curious what the price tag on, on this particular model yeah. looks like. Yeah, this tractor here, uh, we paid 66000 for this tractor and it's went up i think they're about seventy-five thousand now we ordered this tractor in december of 2020 and oh, so when, wow. when pat brought it back and unloaded it here in duper we just sat and stared at it for a while because we didn't even we didn't know if it actually existed because we've been waiting for it for so long and so with the inflation and everything, I think they're about 75,000 now for this tractor. The, the big savings here is the fuel cost. And so, especially locally with having hydropower, uh, if, and especially if you're a Northern Wasco PD customer, our fuel, electric fuel is so inexpensive. You can fuel this tractor, um, and I haven't even charged this particular tractor yet, but we've also got one of the Rivian electric pickups, and I could, I'm on Wasco Electric here at my house. I could fill the pickup up for about eight dollars versus if I took it, and that gives me about a 300 mile range. And if I took it down and, and put Petro in it, it'd probably cost me at least 60 bucks, if not more. And so that's kind of a comparison fuel wise. And I think that's the big thing here. The other thing, particular to these tractors, um, this Monarch tractor is it's actually a mobile mobile power plant. So I actually have a 220 out uh, 30 amp outlet on this, and so we could actually run a welder, a small pump, uh, you know, uh, whatever you have out in the field with this tractor. And so it's got 110 outlets and a 220 outlet on it. Um, um, and so literally we just got it. We've had it a week today. Uh, and so we're, we're still trying to figure out all the features of it, how it operates, all those types of things. And then it'll uh, actually, this tractor is going to Crook County Fairgrounds, but we got two more of these on the way that'll actually be working in some of the orchards locally and stuff. And so, um, Philly, you'd asked about the um, hydrogen. And so I guess from what I see is your smaller horsepower tractors, your mini excavators, those types of things could be battery electric. But any once you get over a certain threshold, and I don't know what that number is going to be, is it is it 70, 80 horsepower? Um, 
the the amount of batteries you'd have to carry to run that bigger equipment would be monstrous. And so I think that's where hydrogen is going to come in. And so New Holland has a, I told you about the electric tractor. They've also got a methane tractor that they've developed. And so methane, um, their thought there is a lot of these dairies have, uh, have digesters on them. And so that they can then use the methane off the digesters to actually run the farm equipment. Uh, Cummins uh, engines, you know, Cummins, uh, traditionally known the Cummins diesel engine, they've actually made two hydrogen combustion engines. One of them is the same engine that's in all the Dodge diesel pickups. And so they basically took the same block and they put a different head on it, but it's designed to burn, it's designed to run on. Uh, hydrogen. And from what I hear uh, about 2027, that they'll actually be offering that in the Dodge pickup lineup. And so what I'm, what I'm saying is I think a lot of the larger horsepower, that's where you're going to see hydrogen. Uh, so I'm going to say 80 horse, 70, 80 horsepower and up, uh, big potential for hydrogen. We hear about the hydrogen hub up out of um, the Boardman Hermiston area and possibly piping that hydrogen down to Google. Um, and one of my questions has always been, well, what else could we do with hydrogen if we had it in the area? And I think the answer is, is uh, running a lot of the large horsepower, whether it be trucks or tractors or what have you. But uh, there's been a lot of talk on hydrogen. So there's two types of hydrogen. There's combustion hydrogen, and that's what like Cummins is working on through their traditional combustion engines. And then there's hydrogen fuel cell. Hydrogen fuel cell is just basically another form of an electric vehicle. It's instead of a battery pack that's powering it, it's a hydrogen fuel cell that's powering that electric vehicle. And so I see big potential in, in hydrogen, I think in just a matter of time. So hey, Robert, we're, we're coming up yeah. on eight o'clock. Okay. So uh, real quickly, does anybody have um, any questions for Robert? Please give us your contact information if you can put that drop that into chat. Okay. Yep. I'll do that. So uh, really great information. We may have to have Robert back. I'll talk to Lisa about that because um, I think he has a lot more information um, to share. So um, one more time, does anybody else have any questions? Can I come out and visit on Friday when uh, <laughs> when they, uh, you folks come in? Yeah, sure. Come on out, Bill. <laughs> Yeah, the other the other thing I was gonna I just want to comment on, and I know there's a presenter that's gonna be on here on a future a future meeting, but we're also working with Forth on a EV charging plan for Wasco County, and so looking at where charging stations should be located, um, and uh, Wit with Forth will be on, um, I think in about a month, and he'll he'll go into detail. But we put together a stakeholder group for that, and really looking at um, kind of you know. We want charging stations other than just along I-84, you know, in our county, in our area. And what we'll actually do with this is actually develop a guidebook for rural counties that they can then use that to help determine where uh, charging stations could be located in their county. So I just want to mention that also. I, I don't see the rest of your. I don't see the rest of your contact information. You might have hit the return. Oh, that sent I hit. Yeah. So and and the chamber is we are in the process of getting a charging station um, installed. I don't know when that will be done, but uh, we're waiting for PUD right now. I think. Yeah, I was worried I was going to have enough to talk about. So I think I, I think <laughs> you I did, did well. <laughs> yeah. So the, I guess I'll just close. A lot of this stuff, this technology that I'm talking about, is all centered right here in a local area, and. Um, you know, it's pretty cool to be able to bring the technology in here. Um, I hope, you know, we've been growing quite a bit um, and stuff. And I think even like the eFarms program, I could see it really being a national program in five years. And, uh, you know, I talk about the innovation hub and I'd love, I love to bring people from across the country in, show them what we're doing, help them get set up and, uh, and all that. So it's pretty exciting to be a part of. All right. Thank you very much. Um, appreciate that. And it was a very interesting topic. So um, with that, we'll say goodbye. Just remember Scott's uh, ribbon cutting next Tuesday at um, 2.15 at the Senior Center. Um, and if you have any questions, um, 
Robert's contact information is on their website um, also. So um, thank you, everybody. And um, Lisa should be back next week. Um, and have a good rest of your week. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Robert. Thanks, everyone. See everybody. Bye.